Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Diamondback Energy, ticker F-A-N-G. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. So first up, we have a market cap of $24 billion, enterprise value of $29 billion. So you can see about $5 billion in net debt on this business. That'll provide some leverage. So if they have good returns, then it boosts it even more. If they have poor returns, it's going to make it even harder to turn well. This is in the oil, gas, and consumable fuels industry. Diamondback Energy business description. They're an independent oil and natural gas company focused on acquisition, development, exploration, and exploitation of unconventional onshore oil and natural gas in Permian Basin in West Texas. These are key pieces. The Permian Basin in particular is known as one of the big shale basins in the United States. West Texas area has developments in Strawberry and Wolf Camp formations in Midland, Wolf Camp, Bone Spring, and Delaware in the Permian, West Texas. So um, Permian is really the big one here um, for this company. They have 524,000 gross acres in the Permian. Estimated proved oil and natural gas reserves of 1.7 million thousand barrels. Okay, 1.7 billion barrels of crude oil equivalent. So pretty um, good information there on what they are doing, but they are basically a shale oil company. I see a beta of 2.0, 2.1 is actually quite high. This means that they're gonna have relatively high volatility as a business. 1.0 is the standard for an S&P 500 company. 2.1 means it's about twice as volatile as the standard S&P 500 company. Now return on vested capital is interesting here because in a quick glance, you can immediately see this company is cyclical. Um, starting 2009, it looks like this is the start of the data set. But if we go to 2010, you're gonna see up, down, up, down, up, down, up typical cyclical company here and you're seeing that this cycle is driving um, their earnings now the other thing you can see here is these cycles are relatively short i mean look from 2010 to 2014 that's a four years until it peaks again 2014 2018 another four years to peak so these are four year cycles that they're seeing and again you're seeing probably another peak in the next year or two in 2022 based upon this four year cycles um one thing to see here is you're having, so in 2010, you have 6.8% return invested capital, 9.2% in 2014, 6.3% in 2018, 11% in 2021. Even at the peak of these cycles, your return on invested capital is quite poor. It's always below 10% besides the most recent year. And in the bottoms of the cycles, they are worse than the peaks. So negative 10% in 2012, worse than six and nine. Negative 19% in 2015, worse than six, nine, and six. Negative 23% in 2020. Not only are these worse than the peaks, but they are significant. They're also getting worse overall. So over the last decade, you've had one, one, two, three, four, five years of losses, five years of profit, six years of profits over the last 12 years. So you're almost losing money about half the time. And when you lose money, you're losing more money than you're making. So this is actually a really poor result in terms of the business quality, very unpredictable, and the losses are quite bad. Now, over a 10 year meeting, if you average it arithmetically, you're getting positive returns, 3.7 return on invested capital, 5% return on equity. But that's actually quite poor because the uh, geometric return is going to be worse than the arithmetic return. What that means is that, you know, when you're on a compounded basis, the returns aren't very good. Now, PE ratio looks cheap, 6.3 PE, 1.7 price to book. The price to book is actually more expensive looking than the PE of 6.3 because the PE is going to be overstating the most recent earnings, especially when you think about what these growth numbers are looking like look at this the revenue in 2012 was 65 million and now you're up to seven billion dollars almost a hundred bagger in revenue over the course of a single decade that's very impressive that's why your revenue kager is 63 percent asset kager 56 percent these numbers are amazing looking and if they could extrapolate out with a pe of 6.3 you'd be like oh this is very very good but again this is in the shale this is basically the shell revolution right here um what you're getting in trouble with though is you're paying a pretty steep price for this. i mean look seven billion dollars in revenue and yet you're paying what, four times sales i don't know why it says 2.7 probably because the trailing 12 month numbers are going to be higher 
we see trailing 12 months, 9 billion. I mean, you're growing astronomically each year in revenue growth, 80%, 80%, 128%, 141%, very, very fast growth rates on revenue, but it's not translated so far into the earnings that you see on any sort of regular, reliable basis. And that's going to be a problem because it makes it really hard to depend upon the numbers that we're seeing. If you keep losing more and more money during the loss years, you're going to have poor results. So you do see the operating profits exploding. You're up to $4 billion in operating profit in that 2021 year, which looks pretty good. I mean, you're six times that operating profit number. Okay. But how reliable is it? Operating margins are all over the place. 23%, 45%, 42%, 16, 33, 50, 48. Again, it's a commodity business. They're selling a commodity. They have zero control over the prices. The only thing they have control over are their costs. But even on a gross margin basis, again, all over the place, 37, 51, 47, 24, 41, they can't control this. And that price of the commodity, natural gas and oil, is driving these results. And it may, just makes it completely unpredictable. If you buy this stock, you could do very, very well. Anytime you have growth rates like this, you could do extremely well. You could also do extremely poorly because it makes it very hard to predict. So big concern here. This is clearly a below average company. Um... It's not that it's necessarily going to be a below average result because on the surface, the PE looks good. Um, but we're just going to have to dig a little bit more to see. If you're enjoying the video so far, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so you can get notified when I upload new videos Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I have over covered over 130 S&P 500 companies. And the playlist at the end of the video will cover that full list of 130 companies. Let's dive on into the income statement. Now, what you do like here is you have 10 straight years of positive growth profit. You have... 10 straight years of positive operating profit. And what's interesting is some of these poor years are not as bad as they look on the first page because your losses are coming from stuff like other non-operating income, other non-operating income losses, and that's driving your losses. Not even that the debt is driving you into losses because you're still positive profitability without the even with your debt loads. I don't think there's a single year where you would have had losses if it wasn't for these these write-offs they're probably write-offs and that's the concern is is like okay how much are we truly getting an idea of what their asset base looks like when you have these large drops and i'm assuming these are write-offs and so when you have these big things they're really kind of like an operating loss um but because they're written in non-operating it makes it easy to not think about it um so it's just something to be aware of um this is basically misallocated spending. And that can actually be a significant amount. I mean, if you think about $6 billion in misallocated spending, that wipes out the entire previous eight years of profits. Okay, so I mean, that's a concern. It's not as simple as say, oh, well, whatever. That's $6 billion. This is a $25 billion market cap company. This is a huge write-off. You had a write-off of a billion, write-off of a billion, write-off of a billion. I mean, very large, billions and billions of dollars of write-offs for a company this size is concerning. Also, they've been growing like gangbusters, but you have to look. They had 37 million shares outstanding to begin the decade. They end it at 177. They have 5 x their shares outstanding. This, I could never invest in a company with this. This shows a management that does not care about shareholder returns. Um, I don't know how much of this is going to management. I don't know how much of this is being used just to fund the business. Um, but this is ridiculous. Um, I mean, if you think about this, this is a huge way on your returns. If you increase the share count by 500% over the decade, that's like a negative 50% reduction in your return on an annual basis, maybe negative 40%. So when you think about like, oh yes, I have 63% revenue growth, but you have to subtract like 50% a year simply due to dilution. And so maybe 40% a year. So maybe you have 13% revenue growth or 20% revenue growth on a per share basis because you're diluting so fast. It's just ridiculous. Um, pp and &E is going up to an astronomical degree. I mean, think about this. You're at $20 billion in PP&E. You don't have $20 billion in profits in the history of the company. There's not even $20 billion in net operating profit here. That's excluding net income. You don't even have the history of that. All of this is coming from dilution. All of this is coming from new debt. 
probably, let's see what your debt base. Yeah, you have $6 billion in debt. You have substantially more paid in capital. This paid in capital is what's really driving it. You're having to reinvest more and more and more and more into the business simply to survive. I do wonder if they had an acquisition here. Not A lot of it's just internal, it looks like. They, they at least don't have any cash spent on this acquisition. Um Maybe they issued stock. But you're issuing stock all the time. You have some limited stock-based compensation, but you're basically constantly issuing stock. Constant dilution. Constantly trying to take on new debt because this is just consuming cash. When you own stock, you want to own a business that is putting out cash, that's paying you cash. You don't want to own businesses that are taking your cash, taking it, taking it, taking it, taking it, and never giving anything back. And maybe this company will give back in the future. The problem is with shale is it has short very fast decline rates, and so it's going to constantly be taking in cash. So if it's not putting out cash today at a $7 billion, $9 billion revenue rate, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? You cannot grow this rate forever. You can't repeat this growth for another decade. So if they don't start putting out cash soon, and to do so, they're going to have to stop growing, um, then they might never put out cash. So to me, I would avoid diamond-backed energy. It's not interesting at all to me as a company. It won't go on my watch list. Um, if you learned something in this video, hit that like button. If you disagree with me or you didn't learn something from this video, let me know in the comments below. I want to hear your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell, get notified. I'm working through every company SP 500. I've covered 130. The playlist is going to be up above to where you can check out all my past videos. I've found some really interesting companies and I've found some really bad companies. But if you'd like to learn, if you'd like to grow as an investor, then I wish you would join me there. The sponsor for this video is quickfs.net. This is the tool I use myself to solve my problems. I think that you could learn from this tool as well. So if you'd like to check it out, the first link in the description below is to quickfs.net. That is my affiliate link. If you sign up for a free or a paid account, then I get credit for sending you to them. And so I would appreciate your support for this channel by, if you choose to sign up, use my affiliate link so that I get credit for sending you to them. This is the tool I use. I hope you found it useful. Thank you for listening. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.